Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the, Cle the Cleveland Heights Historical Center at Superior Schoolhouse. Um, you're at another of our bi-monthly lectures. We're doing real good. We've got some great ones. And we actually, um, this is the first part you're going to hear tonight, which is the early history of the Heights schools. And then on um, Wednesday, June 20th and Thursday, June 21st, um, Bob's going to be discussing the um, school's history from 1940 to 1969, which is the demands of excellence. And um, that information um, was in the, probably in the flyer that you all got or you saw it in the monthly calendar here in Cleveland Heights. Um, for those of you who saw it in the monthly calendar, um, that's how we generally advertise these, these presentations. Also, people who are members of the Cleveland Heights Historical Society um, get flyers in the mail just as another reminder. And um, there's membership forms at the very back of the, um, on the counter there for those of you who are interested in membership. Also, there are um, some flyers about the new school um, uh, superintendent. And also, for those of you who, have, who haven't been here before or haven't signed in when you've been here before, we have a guest book in the back and we always ask people to sign in just because we like to document all the great people who've been through here and I always like to see kids sign in because we tell them they can come back in 30 years and see what they sign their name like in the second grade, see how things have changed. Also, coming up here at the schoolhouse, um, on June, starting on June 14th and going through the fall, we're going to have an exhibit on the history of Kane Park. And um, I've been researching away, and it's got the, a f fantastic history. We've got all kinds of old news clippings and old flyers and things like that. So I welcome everyone to come attend that. And there'll be more information in the monthly calendar as well as information to historical society members. With that, I'll tell you a little bit about Mr. Apple. Um, Bob Apple is a graduate of Heights High along with his wife. He graduated in 1950. All three of his children are Heights High grads. And he told me I could put that, he's, he put that year in there. So um, all three of his children are Heights High grads, and all nine of their grandchildren attend the Heights schools. Um, he was on the, <laughs> he um, was on the school board from 1969 until 1975, and he's also led campaigns for school levies and the library levy. Um, having recently been retired, he is writing the history of the Cleveland Heights University Heights School System. So we get to get a little sneak preview of the research that he's done. With that, I'll turn it over to Bob, and um, we'll take it from there. Thank you, Kara. Uh, before we start, uh, just one, one possibility I want to point out to you. I've been spending a lot of time on 1901 to 1939. And I'm in that 1901 to 1939 mode, which means along comes 1990s equipment, and it has me almost baffled. Hopefully, we'll get through it without any mistakes tonight. Well, it, it was a new century as well as a new year when in April 1901, the school system we now know as Cleveland Heights University Heights was being created. In fact, much of it started right in this building didn't happen all at once, and I'm not sure why it happened at all. Uh -huh. Now, this gets a little tricky, but let me take you through it. It started with the East Cleveland Township. Everything was in the East Cleveland Township, including the village of East Cleveland, the hamlet of Cleveland Heights, and portions of other communities. Somewhere along the line, the village of East Cleveland decided they're going to have their own school district. And the school district would be only a certain area of East Cleveland. The rest of the township, the rest of the East Cleveland township that was not part of the village, became the East Cleveland Township School District. And that included the hamlet of Cleveland Heights and portions of other communities. Well, then along came a, uh, in 1903 or 1904, uh, Cleveland Heights was no longer a hamlet, it became a village, and the school system became the Cleveland Heights School District. So it may have been, I'm not sure why all this happened. It may have been that the village of East Cleveland didn't want the township of East Cleveland to be in the same school district. Or it may have been that Cleveland Heights knew that someday it would grow to be a distinguished city. 
and good cities need good schools. But whatever the reason, the separation began. And the citizens of the hamlet of Cleveland Heights began to establish its own school system under the East Cleveland Township School Board, or school district, with school funding under the auspices of the treasurer of the hamlet of Cleveland Heights. The district's first superintendent was Charles A. Tilden. An arrangement had been made between the East Cleveland Village School Board and the East Cleveland Township School Board in which they had all of their students, many of them would continue to attend Shaw Academy because as we'll see shortly, we didn't have the schools up here to, to account for or to accommodate rather uh, most of the high school kids. Uh, interestingly enough, there was a lawsuit at that time that Cleveland Heights lost. They wanted Shaw Academy, so instead the Shaw Academy went to, to East Cleveland, but on the other hand, uh, there was a certain amount of money that was set aside from the will, from the Shaw uh, will, uh, to, go to, um, uh, to go to the support of the, at that time, East Cleveland Township School District. The two boards met jointly to sh and agreed to share all expenses based on the number of high school pupils and grammar grades as fixed by the enrollment of the pupils in the third quarter of each year. In fact, what they're saying is, we're going we're to see how many students we have throughout, and you get a third of those students, that is, you get the tuition for a third of those students. Well, with this, school, with this uh, separation, the school district now found itself with three schools. The Superior School, this one, in which they first transferred sixth graders, the Noble School, which was an old stone building on Noble and Parkdale, and Fairmont School, which was a dilapidated wooden building, believed to have been on what is now Fairhill, but was then called Fairmont Road. It's near the site of the Baldwin Rose Reservoir, and was the predecessor to Roxborough Elementary. Now, the kids got to the schools by traveling dirt and clay roads, many becoming quagmires after heavy, heavy rain or, or snow thaw. It wasn't the easy way we have today. By the way, this picture was sent to me uh, from a fellow who graduated in, I think, 19, or was in the school, rather, 1922 or 23. His name was Albert Tinsley, and he's now in uh, 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 Ingram, Texas. I just want to read one note here. It says, the enclosed, enclosed pictures obviously from Superior School, and I think all the kids went on to Roxborough, Roosevelt, and on to Heights. A few names I can identify in the photo are Bill Hewitt, Alan, Alvin Prever, Pryor, excuse me, Alvin Pryor, Jack Beer, Annette Webb, and Elaine Meyer. The pretty little girl in the front row is Rosalind something, but memory is not computing well on that one. I think it's, there, there are a lot of, I get a lot of things from all over the country, and this I just thought was particularly interesting. Well, anyhow, we have the three schools, and they're separated by mud, dirt, clay, wood plank roads to a great extent. So the school board moved quickly and sought options on property for a new school building. And in October of 1901, remember 1901, they're still called the East Cleveland Township School District. In uh, October of 1901, they placed a levy on the ballot to purchase, fence, and improve a lot, and to furnish a four-room school building at a cost not to exceed $20,000. That is, the levy in any one year was not to exceed $2,000 until the sum of $20,000, together with any interest that was accrued, would be raised. So the levy, and this is kind of interesting, we don't do this this way anymore, the levy actually went on the ballot as two issues, each one to be voted on separately. The levy was one, and the payout program was the other. And notices announcing the levy were posted at the voting booth and at power polls at prominent intersections of the township. This was the media in those days. The levy won 76 to two. 
The payout issue won 72 to 3. I have no explanation as to why the differences in the two votes, except to assume that voters were no different then than they are now. But the need for that four-room school board was just the start of the Big Bang. A lot was to follow. In 1902, the new school, bu school building was open. It was on Lee Road, just north of Euclides Boulevard. It's on the property that's now occupied by Boulevard Elementary School. Appropriately enough, it was called Lee Road School. In 1903, it housed some elementary and some high school students. And by the way, I must add that in those days, the students in the district were referred to in, in board minutes, in annual reports, and administration records as scholars. <laughs> Probably a fair thing. In 1903, then, Cleveland Heights became a village. And in 1904, the East Cleveland Township School District was renamed the Cleveland Heights School District. And we were on our way. The Lee Road School added a six-room addition in 1905. And the next year, it housed a full four-year high school, along with some elementary school students. But the school still could not accommodate all the students of high school age in the district. Many of them continued to go to Shaw Academy in East Cleveland. Next came Roxborough. It was also, it was also opened in 1906. And it replaced that dilapidated Fairmont School I mentioned before. The original Roxborough was a two-room building. The land had been given to the school district by the Van Swearingen's. And part of what is now Shaker Heights was in the school district. So Van, Van Swearingen's provided a bus to transport, transport the children to and from school. In 1907, the high school had its first graduating class, three girls and two boys. The commencement exercises were from June 9th to June 13th, quite a difference from today, where it's one day. A baccalaureate sermon was given on June 9th by the Reverend Delo C. Grover of the Cleveland Heights Methodist Episcopal Church. On the 11th, class day exercises were held at the church, consisting of the presentation of a play put on by several grades and music performed by the Heights. So they made that first graduation quite an affair. And then on the 13th of October, the commencement address, I'm sorry, 13th of June, the commencement address was given at the high school by Rabbi Moses Gries. Now, if these two speakers are not enough to impress you with the prestige of her humble beginnings, in 1909, the baccalaureate sermon was given by Charles Thwing, then president of Western Reserve University. So we had some, some pretty good people working with us. Now, from the very beginning, our school system provided a truly high-quality level of education. Here, for example, was the Lee Road School course of study, four years, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. That's the high school. First year, they had natural history or zoology, English, algebra, Latin, or ancient history. The second year, physical ge geography and civics, English, plain geometry, Latin from Caesar, or German or advanced arithmetic. The third year was physics, English, advanced algebra, and solid geometry, Latin, this time from Cicero, or German. And the fourth year was chemistry and botany, English, general history, Latin from Virgil, or German. Now, I think we'll probably all agree that the good people of Cleveland Heights may have been living in the country, but they were not bumpkins. Nor were they libertines. In 1913, they allowed the high school girls to hold dances in the school. But dancing was confined to the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, explosive growth of the student population and the continuation of more school building continued. In 1909, the old Noble Elementary School was closed and a new one at Noble and Parkdale was open. And by the way, on June 15th of that year, the superintendent, Charles Tilden, resigned, and the new superintendent replacing him was James McLean. Now, we have two superintendents so far in this 40-year period. Fairfax was opened in 1916. 
And the new high school was also opened in 1916. Now that's the new high school on the Lee Road uh, property, not Cedar and Lake. It had been built on the same grounds as a then existing one, which in turn became an exclusively an elementary school. All the village's high school students could now attend the new high school. But by the fall of 1918, the high school was so crowded that classes were conducted on the stage in the balcony of the auditorium. So an addition to the building was started. Meanwhile, the school administration, ever mindful that appearance was important, established the following dress rules for high school girls. They must wear a midi blouse and skirt or one piece dress of cotton or wool. A plain tailored waist shirt was also allowed and no color was designated. Not allowed were silk stockings, high heeled shoes, dresses of Georgette or silk. I don't know what Georgette is, but maybe you do. <laughs> Not allowed were silk stockings, high heeled shoes, dresses of Georgette or silk, paint or rouge, jewelry except for wristwatches, class pins, or your class rings. Now I didn't find, I didn't find uh, any dress code for boys, but the pictures from the time uh, shown, sh showed them wearing shirts and ties. So we've come a long way, baby, or have we? <laughs> now, John Barden became a member of the school board in 1916, and he wrote in his recollections to the Women's Civic Club of Cleveland Heights the following. One of the first efforts of the new board was to conduct a survey of the village west of Coventry to determine the location of a new schoolhouse in that area. Our report indicated that in 1918 there would be one and a half pupils per lot to be provided with school facilities. So it was before the advent of apartment houses in this area. And while the Men's Civic Club voted to approve the report of the committee, Many of us members said the committee talked like drunken sailors. No one at that time could visualize the rapid growth of the school population that follows. But I, I think that the rapid growth would even have surprised John Barden and the rest of the school board. In 1918, the population, school population is 2,300. By 1940, it was a 9,200, a 400% increase. Now, when the school board put a bond issue on the ballot in 1916 to build Coventry School, it was met with strong opposition. What else is no? <laughs> the issue failed, as did a second one. Then a year was taken, Barden states, to educate the people to see what was apparent to the Board of Education in the rapid development of the school population of Cleveland Heights. And when the third bond issue was proposed, it was carried by an overwhelming vote, and it still had opposition. Now here's an interesting thing. I, I want to show you this because this comes from a group of voters of Euclid Heights who are asking for justice. And basically what they're asking for is right over here. Is it fair to the people who have come to the Heights and have chosen a section in a highly restricted neighborhood for their homes and after having spent a small fortune in beautifying the section to have a schoolyard for their outlook? They weren't happy with that. By the way, this was, they were then going on to talk about this woman who had an estate and she was adding to the estate. And if you look up, this may look familiar to you. This is the home that the Zalajis now own, right around the corner on uh, Euclid Heights Boulevard. Well, Barden goes on that even though the, the issue passed, our entrance into the World War had then begun and the building was delayed on this account. When Coventry was finally opened in 1919, it was filled to capacity. It included the junior high grades, which were subsequently transferred to Roosevelt in 1924. There were no junior high schools prior to that. Junior high grades went in the same schools, these either the high school kids or in some instances the elementary school kids. Meanwhile, the Fairfax School had been completed as an eight-room unit, but it was immediately apparent that further enlargement would be necessary. When he left the board in 1920, Fairfax had become a building of 32 rooms. That's a great looking building. It's hired a lot of the old ones. 
Now, Roxborough Elementary was also entirely built, rebuilt during Barden's term of office. And in the 1918-1919 school year, a new school came into being that only lasted for four years. I was called it the Phantom School. I had not heard anything about it until I started my research. It was called Severance School. No, not the Severance Millican, but a Severance School. It was located on Taylor near Beechwood Avenue. The 1918-19 school district annual report states, through the kindness of Mr. John L. Severance in presenting to the schools a dwelling, your board was enabled to open a school for little children on Taylor Road. This has greatly benefited many who found it a long trip to Superior. Today, they probably ride their bikes back and forth without thinking about it. And anyhow, the building was most likely a house. It held 64 pupils at its peak, and it closed after the 1922-23 school year. So much for severance. The 20s ushered in other schools as well as school building expansions. Portable, portable buildings were very popular as they couldn't build permanent ones fast enough. The Roxborough School's history notes that the school kept adding portable classrooms around it that were heated by stoves. The outside doors had to be kept ajar to allow the fumes to escape. Is that familiar to any of you? In the winter, teachers and students kept their boots and scarves on. They toasted on one side and froze on the other. Early one morning, the portable for the fourth grade burned to the ground. In 1920, the board had planned to put an addition on the main building, but now what they decided that the, but they decided first that the school should be moved further back from the street before the addition was added. So more portable classrooms brought in and all the students from the school building went into the portable rooms. They started moving the building back. They put it on rollers. Well, as they started moving, it sagged in the middle, pipes broke, electrical wires tore out, everything was going wrong. It was finally decided that it would be cheaper to tear it down and build a brand new building. That's the building that was opened in 1921. Of course, things have changed even to today. You would not see those windows quite the way they are. It's the media center now. That's the media center now? Yeah, in front of that. Ah, okay. All right, I'm not sure whether they did right or wrong, but anyhow. <laughs> um, in 1921, the annex to the, to the high school was also completed. You notice a sign here, it says Board of Education. I'll talk about that in a minute. But this was the uh, annex to the high school. You can see it over in the side there. And um, in 1922, the new Noble School Building was opened at Parkdale and Ardoon. So Noble kept moving a lot. Uh, 1922 saw the opening of Taylor Road School. It contained kindergarten through ninth grades. That's a magnificent looking school. And uh, I'll tell you later why it was torn down. In 1924, Boulevard Elementary School opened on its present site. It had 19 classrooms. In 1927, it was expanded to include a cafeteria, auditorium, two gyms, and two additional classrooms. And so, what you're seeing there from the Boulevard Breezy bits of January uh, 1927 is that expanded building. Now, in 1923, junior high schools were organized in accord with the Withers Survey recommendation that the junior high grades be separated from the senior high and established as a separate unit under a separate administration. What would become Roosevelt, Roosevelt Junior High was at that time housed in several portable buildings and the Lee Road School Building, the building that would later become the Board of Education. In 1926, okay, I don't know why I've got this here, but in 1926, Roosevelt would occupy the other building on Lee Road property vacated by Cleveland Heights as the high school moved into the new building across the street. Uh, this happens to be Rock's Middle, and I'm not, not sure where I got in there, but. That's the difference in technical, technical modes. Anyhow, um, let me go on and see if we've got, okay, that's, uh, that's not what I'm looking for. Well, let me, let me get on, this is, this is Coventry, and, uh, and we, saw, we, we saw before, I can't go back in this silly thing, so we saw uh, Rock's Middle before. But anyhow, 
In 1926, Roosevelt would occupy the other building at Lee Road property vac vacated by Heights High as the high school moved in its new building at Cedar and Lee. As John Chirk of the Heights class of 1928, any of you know John? He wrote in that year's cauldron about their experiences in Roosevelt's beginning. We had a hand in choosing the new name and the colors for the school. Roosevelt was the name we chose, and the colors, of course, blue and white. In Roxborough, at the same time, the other half of we, the January class of 1928, were having a good time sponsoring Friday dances, having Tom Thumb weddings, and printing an unusual annual in that it came out four times a year instead of one. In 1923, Roxborough's junior high grades were in the Roxborough Elementary School. And in 1926, the junior high went into its own building next door. And that was that colored picture I showed you before that I moved along too quickly. But you can go up there and see it today. It's, it's not a great deal different. In uh, 1924, the eighth graders from Coventry were transferred to Roosevelt. And this happens to be a picture of the old Coventry school. Um, and in 1927, the students in 8A from Noble were also uh, transferred to Roosevelt Junior High. 1923 saw the appointment of a new superintendent, Frank Wiley, who replaced James McLean. We now have three superintendents so far. In October 1925, in, excuse me, in, in 1925, uh, Oxford Elementary School opened in three portable buildings with 78 students two teachers and a principal. I don't know who was more Harry, the teacher who had 39 kids in her, her class, or the kids who, who were part of the 39. But uh, what happened then is that uh, the actual school building was finished and first occupied in 1927. The students had come from Noble School. Junior high students, in this case, seventh, eighth, and ninth grades, were housed in the Quilliams wing of the building something new, and in the 1925-26 year, there was a Quilliam School that housed kindergarten through third grades. It existed for two years. In 1926, no, there's the Oxford School we talked about. Hold on, there we go. In 1926, the new high school was opened after several construction delays. According to the January 1928 class historian, I quote, we had been at Old Heights about a year and a half when the new building was declared finished and ready to use. We packed a bag and baggage and went off with high hopes and expectations, but lo and behold, when we arrived, we found the place to be a labyrinth of halls, stairs, and queer rooms. Our granddaughter who goes there now says it isn't any different. <laughs> it took us quite a while to find our way about, they said. We, the A2s, admit that we were among those who took advantage of the excuse of not being able to find the room. By arriving 10 minutes late, we missed having to answer that awful question or explaining that terrible first problem. My granddaughter says that doesn't fly anymore. <laughs> the first graduating class from the new building was in 1927. Canterbury opened in uh, 1927 in portable buildings, of course. This is what Canterbury looks like today. In 1929, the Superior School, this school, was organized as the Superior Opportunity School, providing classes for the mentally retarded. Monticello Junior High opened in 1930-31 school year with 560 students in grades six, seven, and eight. And today, it looks like this. Very similar architecture, by the way, to Rock's Middle. When the 20s began, new and additional programs were introduced to the mathematics, science, history, French, Latin, and Spanish departments to upgrade the curricula and better prepare students for college. Most departments saw a significant increases in enrollment and increasing de demand for college preparation courses. But you know, how real was that demand? And how did it affect the rest of the student body? Well, Heights High Principal Carl Burt wrote in the 1920-21 annual report to the Board of Education, a survey of the pupils of the school last June showed that of the 775 pupils, this is 8th through 12th grades, 
whose intentions were ascertained, 503 intended to go on to college. This is a remarkably high percentage and indicates that great emphasis must be laid on college preparation. Care must be taken, however, that the interests of the non-college bound pupil be continually kept in mind and that he be provided with those opportunities and experiences which make for a useful life. And Mr. Burt's concerns would become that of the entire community just a year later. In considering what was important in education, one of my favorite commentaries comes from Superintendent McLean's statement on standards in the same annual report. Here's part of what he had to say. Apparently, our country faces a long struggle against ignorance and against false theories of social relations. We'll get, a little, we'll get little help from youth brought up on excessive leisure, on too much spending money, on self-owned automobiles, on freedom from responsibility, and on defense from the discipline that alone makes fine and strong the spirit. This is 1921. Abraham Lincoln's cannot be, uh, cannot be bred in, on such a regimen. Our young people are too precious, too significant in the world's affairs to warrant our robbing them of their right to training and thoroughness and obedience. A profound old Latin motto says, ad astra per aspera, to the stars through difficulties. The intelligent parent, he goes on, counsels his children on the meaning and power of right standards of conduct. He, en he uh, emphasizes the necessity of drill that is often distasteful, the power of ideas, the value of discrimination, the beauty of personal character, the need for work and as sacrifice. The youth well grounded on such principles can forget or can afford to forget some of his book facts. He will arrive. He is a good citizen and is fitted to stand firm and strong in his place when his times call for high leadership. Well, I think if James McLean were here today to read what he wrote, he might possibly quote another old adage, this time from the French. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they remain the same. <laughs> now, if you recall, I mentioned before the Withers Report. This is an interesting report. It was a survey that was done in 1922 of the Cleveland Heights Schools. It was conducted by John W. Withers, Dean of the School of Education of New York University. While it had commendatory things to say about the system, it also presented some major weaknesses and problems. It declared that, now get this, the intellectual composition of Cleveland Heights pupils is, grade by grade, far above that of other pupils in other cities in which the same intelligent measures were used. I don't know why we attracted them, but we apparently did. Despite, despite the superiority in date of intelligence, the Heights elementary pupils, when measured by standard reading, spelling, and arithmetic tests, failed to maintain their superiority and, many, and in many instances fell behind the pupils of other cities whose intellectual composition was inferior. Another part of the survey charged the high school curriculum is narrow and, quote, per perverted to the end that pupils shall be able to pass examinations for certain Eastern colleges to which very few pupils actually go. In short, the curricula were tailored for an elite few at the expense of the rest of the students. The survey recommended that school, schools plan a program of studies that meet the needs of all the students. It appears as though the school board and administration may have forgotten who the citizens of Cleveland Heights were and what they wanted for their children. Now, the survey also declared that the high school staff is understaffed and the teacher's load was far too heavy for satisfactory results. That French adage may play a part in this, too. But it also raised the teaching, it praised the teaching of the Cleveland Heights schools as being among the very best found in public schools of the United States. By the way, he had done a number of surveys in other cities too. Well, I think that the school system should also be judged by what its students do beyond the classroom. And the Heights schools deserve high marks in such endeavors. For example, during the 20s, many extracurricular clubs were started at Heights High including 
a literary club, journalism club, boys glee club, operetta club, biology club, chemistry club, art club, history club, French club, rat Latin club, Spanish club, and commercial club, and I've not named all of them. At Roxborough Junior High, they organized a Latin club, dramatic club, book club, model boat club, chess club, girls glee club, hiking club, travel club, art club, stamp club, and boys scout club. And are you ready for this? There was the Captores Die Club, which read books about Romans and gave plays in Latin. And the French Club, which conducted their meetings in, controver in conversational French, maybe it's controversial too, <laughs> but in conversational French. Clearly, they were not intellectual slouches. Then came the Depression years. And the Depression years cast their pall, starting back as far as the 28-29 school year. Enrollment had been 8,104. By June 31, the enrollment was up to 8,906. And one reason for this increase was that many families whose children had been going to private schools could no longer afford to send their children to those schools, and so they went to the public schools instead. In the early 30s, there was a mother's club organized among the patrons of Heights High School for the purpose of providing aid to needy, worthy children. The club provided dental service, glasses, hospital expenses, clothes, and sometimes even commencement gowns and school yearbooks for graduating seniors. And the PTOA organizations and many of the other schools provided free lunches as well as necessary clothing and school supplies. So you had a lot of community support there during these very rough years. Of course, the teachers weren't immune to uh, the Depression either. The salary schedule that was adopted on June 9, 1920, was still in force without change in 1931 for 11 years. The salary, uh, and, and for a bachelor's degree, the, salary, the starting salary uh, was $1,500, the maximum $3,300, and yearly increments were $150. Each year that you stayed in the system, you got another $150. Prior to the 1931-32 year, appointments had been made on an annual contract with specific salary payments based on a definite dollar amount shown on the salary schedule. But starting with the 1931-32 school year, Variable salary contracts were written based on fixed or variable percentages of the old schedule. So in 31-32, the teachers were paid 100% of that schedule that hadn't changed since 1920. Oops. But from then on through the 1942-43 school year, they received salaries ranging from a low of 73% of the base to 95% of the base, they never got back to 100% of the base until 1943-44. And the 1920 schedule was not amended until April 1946. 1920 to 1946, without an amended salary schedule. Anyhow, in, 43, in 34 and 35, it was also reported confusion regarding the future stability of the schools and the matter of public sympathy and support of education have tended to undermine the morale of many teachers. Most have been able to suppress worries and give their best thought and energy to their work. Some of the others, however, are near the breaking point from nervous strain. And yet, as difficult as the Depression years were, the schools and their supporters met them with vision and, I think, with unyielding determination to provide the best educational environment possible for those going on to college and for those who were not. Now, by the end of the 1930s, Cleveland Heights had 13 schools in operation, eight elementary schools, three junior high schools, Heights High School, and Superior School, which I had mentioned before was referred to as the Opportunity School. Uh, Superior contained 13 pupils in grades one through six. The Arome, uh, 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 grades one through six at Superior. The total school enrollment not superior, but the school, total school district enrollment was around 9,000. During those first 40 years, we had exactly three superintendents, Tilden, McLean, and Wiley. 
Now it seems we get three superintendents every three years. I'm exaggerating, but it's a big change. Now, there's much, of course, which is not in this limited presentation of mine. I simply cannot talk fast enough to cover everything. But there's one other subject I cannot ignore entirely, music. This became and remains one of the crown jewels of our school system, and it really deserves a presentation of its own. But here are just a few of the milestones in those first four decades that have to do with music. In 1908, a high school glee club was formed, it consisted of 24 boys and girls. In 1920, a high school orchestra was formed. In 1929, the Heights Band was formed. The director was Mark, Han Mike Mark Hinsley. The next year, it would be rated tops in Cleveland. In 1934, the Heights Orchestra, under Ralphie Rush, captured first division honors in, national high in the National High School Orchestra competition at Madison, Wisconsin, and then again in 1938 at Elkhart, Indiana. In October of 1930, the Heights Choir was first formed under, his, under the genius of George Strickling. Now that's interesting because George Strickling was still at school when I went to Heights. And he was a genius. And he was well loved. He would take them to greatness for 35 years. And in 1923, in 1933, the a cappella choir sang at the Chicago World's Fair. In 1931, the Noble School Orchestra was organized. It was the first elementary school orchestra in the district. In 1933, Heights High Band received highest honors by placing the first division for both marching and playing at the Century of Progress exhibition in Chicago. 70 bands from 20 states competed. By 1939, Noble and Oxford schools had a boys and girls choir, and Boulevard had a mixed course. I wish there were time to tell you more about music in the height system. But so it goes. As the next decades arrive, the school system would go on to even greater heights, pun intended. Thank you. I'll be happy to try and field any questions that uh, anyone might have. Yes, sir. Uh, that, um, that notice that you showed there that uh, was against the building of the school building that Coventry. Mm -hmm. uh, why did that say voters of Euclid Heights? Well, because in those days there were various areas of Cleveland Heights that were referred to by a more specific uh, uh, name. And Euclid Heights, Carrie, you're going to have to help me on this. I know that Euclid Heights was part of it, but. So that's not the same Euclid Heights as today. No. Uh, no, no there, there was a subdivision called Euclid Heights, and what that was was the area. I just happened to have written a 300-page thesis on it, so I can tell you a lot more than you probably care to hear. Um, can you get him a copy? <laughs> bedtime reading will put you right out. Um, north of Cedar and west of Coventry, up to Mayfield, that whole section of Cleveland Heights was called Euclid Heights subdivision. Much as new developments today have various little subdivisions. That subdivision was called Euclid Heights, and for a long time it was one of the first ones, and this whole area was called Euclid Heights, thus Euclid Heights Boulevard. Um, at that point, it, that was a very elite subdivision, so they would have... Was there also a, a Euclid Heights where it is now? I mean, it, it wouldn't have been a city. Was there a village of Euclid Heights or wherever Euclid Heights is? I don't know. Oh. I don't think so. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Yes? We have an old... Uh, Heights High Cauldron, if I remember correctly, it's from 1903. And on the frontage page, it has a um, etching of John Spence. And if I remember correctly, calls him president of the school board. Now, I'm confused about the roles then. What was the difference between the president and a superintendent? John Spence was part of a three-man school board, along with a uh, fellow by the name of F.A. Balin, and H.W. Uh, Ward. And as you know, school boards have a president. Um, somebody's got to handle all the questions, I guess. Whereas when I'm telling you about Tilden, he's the superintendent. 
So the superintendent actually physically ran the schools where the school board would vote? Sure. Money right now we stuff. have our superintendent, Paul Mason, who is leaving. We've got a new superintendent coming on. He runs the whole administration. That's exactly right. The okay. Board of Education is really the representation of the representatives of the school district to try and assure that the schools are meeting in the needs of, of the students of the district. Yes, ma'am. In the second grade, Mr. James McClain came every Friday afternoon and told our second grade class a story. And he just not only came once, he came every Friday afternoon. And that's something. So that he was right on his job. Oh, yeah. Well, in those days, we had very few administrators, uh, but they kept, we kept expanding that, that area, of course, because the schools were just expanding like crazy. Uh, good business had been in in that time were portable school buildings. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Do you know whether that John Spence would have been the contractor? The, uh, yes. The These are Spence relatives. Oh, right. yes. <laughs> they may answer your question better. And it was Spence Brothers Construction Company, yes. So were they the same Spences who lived at White Road? That was my uncle. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Yes, sir. Thanks. Hi, Bob. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, You've been hidden over there. Yeah. But we came late, and, and you might have actually covered this, but uh, I'm interested in the, uh, the history of the boundaries of the district. Did you cover that earlier? Uh, how, how the district was actually created and why it was created the way it was? You know, I don't know the particulars of that, Only, does, but I do know that they changed somewhat. For example, there was a time when a large section of what is now Shaker Heights belonged to this school district. There was also, uh, obviously, a time, but I don't know the specific streets, Kara may know, when they, when they separated the village of East Cleveland from the township of East Cleveland, and I'm not even sure what the portions of the other communities looked like. Good question. I'll have to, I'll have to uh, check that out. Your next project. <laughs> <laughs> yes, could, sir. Could that be the, the genesis of the present Caledonia area split? Yes, Caledonia was never part of the Cleveland Heights School District. When the split came around, they stayed with uh, East Cleveland. With the village school district. Correct just as there are parts of South Euclid that when the split came, came over and was part of, uh, of uh, Cleveland Heights School District. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you, re you referred a number of times to the portable classrooms. I wondered what sorts of buildings they were. Well, oh, Carrie, you've got some pictures? I've seen pictures. Yeah. Like, I was trying to remember when you were talking about them. They were, the, the one picture I saw, I think it might have been one of the ones at Roxborough actually, it was a very simple rectangular kind of shoebox with a gable, mm -hmm. white clapboard, a couple windows, you know, much nicer looking than the portable classrooms that we see around today, but it was just a very simple white gabled classroom. They, by portable, they, they weren't actually built on site, they were carried in, was that it? I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably what happened, yeah. they were sort of pre pre-constructed yeah, and brought on. Job. They all were the same. It was just, you know, sort of like they have the ones and they bring them. It wasn't portable and it was on wheels. I mean, they must have built a slab or something to put them on. Any other questions? Well, let me leave you all with, with a thought. Uh, I talk about the fact that we've gone on to greater heights. In my view, we're still at those great heights. Unfortunately, all too often, people talk about what's happened to our Heights school system. We've gone through some very difficult times, but I think, and it's not just my opinion, it's the opinion of many of the kids who are at Heights High, for example, that our school system still provides an extremely good education for those who want it. Thank you. Thank you.